I reckon the fact that there are students here, some of you may be in the preclinical phase of medical school, others in the clinical arm of medical school, or some of you already graduates. Now, I want you to understand that as far as you're a medical student, you're a dental student, you can win a scholarship at the basic level. That's just the truth. Because um, when someone graduates from medical school, you're seen differently. Now, it may vary depending on the kind of school, you know, one is aiming to get into. There are some schools they may call Ivy League schools. In Nigerian setting, for instance, we may not call them Ivy League schools, but we know some schools are very competitive. Like when you think of Ibadan, you know, University College Hospital, there are some schools that are seemingly on the upper echelon in terms of you know stratification and grading for any any medical student any medical doctor can get a scholarship it depends largely on how you present yourself how prepared you are and how much knowledge you know that you have so we're going to be learning today um, about the preparations and positioning for local and global scholarships can you see my slides Can you see my slide? Someone respond. Yes, sir, we can. All right, all right, thank you. Okay, so Jesus said in the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower, seated not down first and counted the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Now, this scripture is quite profound. You have a goal, you have, you know, a target you want to be a beneficiary of a scholarship you have a role to play it's very important if you want to build a house you want to build a tower you have a responsibility to identify what it will cost you what it will cost you bit by bit after you've identified you start going into sourcing for resources and then eventually you take action because you know sometimes we make the mistake um, of assuming maybe some things are left to chance or to fate or just favor, you know, like a miracle happening. But in our present day world, opportunities are there, scholarships are there. That's just the simple truth. But you have a role to make your discovery, you have a role to prepare, and you have a role to take action. Don't forget discovery, preparation, and action. These are the three pillars on which successful scholarship applicants strive on. There will be a lot of scholarships that you know you are eligible for, whether within Nigeria, within Africa, or outside the shores of Africa. At the basic level, a scholarship is a form of financial aid which is awarded to students and to help for education. Now, unlike loans, you are not expected to repay for scholarships. Now, scholarships can come in different forms. It can be fully funded, it can be partially funded. Some scholarships go the extra mile to cover things as, you know, things like healthcare and your living expenses. So you're literally being paid to study. You know, their interest is just be a very responsible individual because imagine, let's say you're going for a postgraduate scholarship. They are giving you enough money you are not being taxed. You know, scholarship funds are not taxed. There's no taxation on them. They are going to pay for any health issue you have. So all they expect you to do is to commit to personal and professional development and also remain studious, remain committed to your academics. So it, it's something that is worth looking forward to. It's something that is worth preparing for. Um, and some of the v values would include financial relief. If you're trying to Currently, you know, in, in the country, we're having some schools increase accommodation fees, increase tuition fees or school fees, as we like to call it, quote unquote. And then you're trying to go abroad, just converting the you know, Naira to pounds. I know we see how low in financial power our currency currently is. So it takes away that burden. Number two benefits of scholarship is academic recognition. There are some scholarships that you win. now. All scholarships will carry this future, but there are some scholarships that you are a beneficiary of that forever your CV stands out for that purpose. Because when you're presenting your CV, you know, to an organization, maybe for a job opportunity or for further study, like a PhD. 
when you say someone has won a scholarship, what they are thinking about is not necessarily that this person is brilliant. They are thinking, okay, for this individual to have won a scholarship, this person is a responsible person. This person is most likely someone that is a leader. This person is most likely someone that is concerned about, you know, issues pertaining to the community because you will see that they all have similar criteria, just as, you know, some may very slightly, but these are the things that they'll be having in mind. Another benefit is networking opportunities. Within Nigeria, outside Nigeria, scholarships give you the opportunity to network. Now, this is a more established when you gain scholarships outside the country because it's a pool of individuals from all over the world most times. So, and these persons are coming from more than two thirds of the world, and they will usually have these, you know, formal bodies where you get to meet. So by virtue of maybe that one year experience or that two year experience, you would automatically have friends and quote unquote connections in every part of the world, which you can decide to maintain. So you're traveling to this country tomorrow, you know somebody there, you know, some of these things will come. For some of them, you get to meet very um, profound leaders uh, in the public health space, depending on the niche that you are going into. People that are in their 70s, their 60s, and you can establish connections with them. Then there's the aspect of personal and professional growth. Most of these scholarships is not just focused on academics. When people go on holidays, they start organizing programs. Some programs are tailored towards leadership. Some programs are tailored towards productivity. Some programs are tailored towards impact. So it's beyond just the funding. You have opportunity to grow as an individual. You have opportunity to also grow professionally. Some will take care of summer internships in another country entirely. It just depends on the terrain which you find yourself and the scholarship that you are privileged to get. And so we have various kinds of scholarships that you should be aware of. We have some that are merit-based. Now, merit-based meaning there's a standard that is expected and they will not go below that standard. For some scholarships, they expect students to maybe be on a first class or for medical students, distinctions you should have had one or two distinctions during your stay in school or merits can also be outside academics like they have stringent criteria pertaining to leadership you should have been a leader for so so duration of years sometimes it's community involvement they will assess the level of impact so it can vary merits in that sense is not strictly academic it can vary some scholarships are need-based so students will have to demonstrate the fact that they need this scholarship you know, parental, either for some persons who maybe parents are no longer alive, there's no guardian to sponsor, or even though they have guardians or parents, they will have to provide proof of financial statements to show that they cannot, you know, fund the scholarship or fund their education, so to say. So, but this now, if you're, if, you're, if you're talking about going abroad, most likely most persons will fall into this, you know, criteria because when you convert again, deny to pounds, it definitely falls short of it. But also within our terrain, you know, in Nigeria, in Africa, there are some scholarships that are needs based. You have to demonstrate the fact that you actually need the scholarship. Some are field specific, you know, like Agbami, a popular scholarship, which we'll see as we go forward. It's targeted towards medical students and students in engineering. It's not as generalized. Some are institutional. It's only if you are a part of that institution that you can benefit from scholarship. Most times, these are private-owned institutions or scholarships that are funded by private individuals. So you can only find them in that particular institution. Some are demographic-based, either based on age. So this is another thing that is important. Do not waste time. So for it's good not... Talking about academic excellence now, it's not just because you want to... Um, be best students or all of that, which is good, but you need to finish school on time. Some scholarships are age sensitive because they believe that the youth carries energy. And one thing scholarship bodies are looking out for is people that will be able to make impact. So some put the cap at age 25, some put the cap at age 30, some put their caps at age 35. So it's important that you take the leap and do what you can to finish school on time, It is essential. Some scholarships are government or NGO funded. Some are partially funded, like I said at the beginning, and some are fully funded. Now, local scholarships in our setting, 
Some are provided by the government. Within Nigeria, we have the Federal Scholarship Board, and they give student scholarships year in, year out. Amounts to about 150,000 as of two years ago, though I heard there was an increment yearly. You know, that's what they commit to what every student that is a beneficiary of that scholarship. Now, demographic-wise, again, talking specifically about level students who fall into, most of these scholarships tend to go for students between 100 and 300 level. So again, if you're in your preclinicals, this is the best time for you to start applying for scholarships. There is hardly any scholarships that applies to students in their 400 level. I'm not sure I've seen any. So you have to be aware. Some are oil companies, non-governmental organizations, you know, other individuals. And we have examples like the ABAMI, Chevron, the NMPC Scholarship, Nigerian Petroleum Development Corporation or CEPLAT. We have the MTN Foundation Scholarship, NLNG Scholarship, Shell, Jim Ovia, Nigeria Women Association of Georgia, and of course the Federal Scholarship. But most of you in your preclinicals would uh, be eligible for this scholarship. That's the truth between year one and year three. So you, the, the thing for you to do now will be, this is bringing you awareness. So you have to set up a system and most of them you'll find on Scholastica to set a reminder, maybe monthly apply for this scholarship because we can be very carried away with you know, academic work, maybe service work, and then we just sort of forget. And once you miss the deadline, you've missed it. And it might be specific for the level that you are in. So by the time you move into another level in the following year, you may no longer be eligible for the scholarship. So it's good that we keep this in mind. Global scholarships. For those of us who are maybe in our final years, we're doing internship, postgraduate, this applies to you. The providers can range from universities. There's something that makes them um, the schools abroad unique. There are some universities that they just have funds dedicated to this purpose. Once you apply to the school and you obviously distinct your, you know, distinguish yourself from your application, the personal statement and everything, you don't have to apply for the scholarship. They are going to essentially push the scholarship on you because they appreciate maybe the value that they can perceive that you are bringing and that you will bring to the organization. Some are government funded, some are funded by trusts, people who have passed on and maybe they were very wealthy, they've left money behind and it just goes to training students. So there was one recent one that happened in the US where a, an elderly woman committed a billion dollars just to train medical students for perhaps the next two decades. So these opportunities they exist, some local corporations, some individuals. Now, prestigious examples that you should be aware of includes the Fulbright Scholarship, Chevenin Scholarship, very popular, very popular. People get it year in, year out. Currently, they are releasing, you know, letters of awards to students within Nigeria and across the globe. You should be aware of Erasmus Mundo Scholarship. The Rhodes Scholarship is one outstanding. It's actually the oldest scholarship in the world. Yeah, you can check that out. It's very competitive, very competitive. But if you get a Rhodes Scholarship, you know, that can be a life changing opportunity for you. And it covers up to three years of training. So most students who apply for the Rhodes do their master's program and do their PhDs or the DPhil, you know, as it were. And it's specific for Oxford University. There's MasterCard Foundation Scholarship that um, supports training in schools across Africa, South Africa. Canada, some in the United States, University of Edinburgh in the United States, some in the UK, um, United, University of Oxford, University of Cambridge, so a couple of them like that. The Marco McBain Scholarship is for Canada, MCGU University, and then also we have some corporations within Nigeria that fund training for people abroad. An example is the Niger Delta Development Corporation. Now, this is specific to the demographic of those that are from the Niger Delta region. And then we have TED Fund. So this is bringing you awareness. Rightfully so now, after this meeting, we should be able to go back and research on some of these scholarships, look at the criteria that they have, and then begin to set our reminders. So you will find these online. And it's something I do. I'm, um, subscribe to most of the newsletters for these bodies and year in year out 
the notifications keep coming. And once you feel that the timing is right for you, it's now left for you to go ahead and apply for the scholarship. So we talked about discovery. That's the phase of awareness. Now we are entering into the part where it's our responsibility to prepare based on the awareness that we've had. What does it cost to win a scholarship? This is where you have to understand the eligibility. Academic requirements, it can vary. Some are very strict on first class distinctions, but 70% of scholarships are not bent on that for medical students. That's the simple truth. Most scholarships, you're able to go to medical school within the required time. You know, there was no repeat and all that. Now, the twist is that some scholarships even appreciate it when there are students who faced academic challenges. Perhaps they failed a class and they were able to bounce back to get on their feet. And there was a, there, there's this guy, Dr. Tolu, currently is in the United States um, doing internal medicine, internal medicine residency in one of the you know, hospitals abroad. He was a beneficiary of the Rhodes Scholarship. He had a receipt in medical school. I think this was Ibadan also, you know, because he shared the story and somehow between that receipt and final year he lost some of the awards he got but he was able to come back to turn out the best graduating student and he was for the year he won the road scholarship he was the first amongst the two persons you know that won it road scholarship is for the entire west africa so you can imagine those two persons out of over three thousand applicants so the fact that you faced a challenge doesn't take you out of the list of those who are opportune to be a beneficiary of scholarships. Extracurricular involvement, it's key. We'll see some practical examples. So when we are saying, you know, maybe be part of a board in CMDA, engage in editorial board, write, you know, maybe engage in debates, go for outreaches, all of those things will count as, this is one of the things I love the most about CMDA. And I was a CMDA student, now I'm a CMDA doctor from year one to final year. And just getting towards the, you know, final phase of medical school, scanning and looking through scholarships that are available, I already felt in, I felt I was in a good position. Yes, because if you served, you know, let's say from year one to year six or year two, whatever the case, when you're looking at this extracurricular involvement, it often includes leadership experience and you're listing all those offices, all those boards that you served as maybe secretary, all of those things count. So. You know, you're getting a holistic training as a CMD student or perhaps even as a CMD doctor. So it counts. Community service. What are you doing for the environment that you're in? Some people are part of volunteer organizations. Some people are founded NGOs themselves out of the passion, you know, that is brimming in their heart. For some, pers for some persons, like I said earlier, it's based on need and we should be aware that there are specific criteria for different scholarships. So whichever scholarship you're going after, you have to look at what they have set out for you to meet in order to be considered for the scholarship. This is a reminder, do not be casual or do not be nonchalant. It's important to say this because there are many students in thousands applying for that slot that you're applying for. So sometimes it's not that you um, not lived the life worthy of the scholarship, but sometimes it's in the application. You write a personal statement anyhow, you do not package your CV where you, did, you are not being detailed about the experiences you've had, the impact, you know. It's not just about occupying a position. They are interested in the impact you've made. I'll talk more about this when I get to the you know point of personal statement. So don't be, don't apply anyhow. Initially, you know, now applying for scholarships, you know, again, when I look at some of the personal statements I wrote, then I just laugh and I'm like, this was, I'm not even sure that, you know, these people consider this thing at all then. But, you know, I applied for a few things recently just for the fun of it, because I know I wasn't going to take the opportunities. You're allowed, you know, to reject scholarships if you feel the timing is not right for those who maybe want to try their hands on actually applying to have the experience because i learned from those experiences it's important and you know just seeing the feedbacks coming from a few of them you know okay acceptance and all that and 
I can obviously see that me personally have grown in my own application process. So though I am le- I had to learn by experience, but that's the essence of you know maybe seminars like this to bring you awareness, to bring you knowledge, so that when you're applying the first time and you feel you are ready, you can take the opportunity and you can jump at it. And success, a popular quote, you know, we are aware of success is where preparation meets opportunity. There is a way you are going to package your portfolio and, you know, make the application that across the entire board of persons who are reviewing, because each the way these boards work, you know, they have persons who review applications and everybody will say, oh, these are my first 10 candidates. These are my first 10 candidates. Once each once everybody in that committee, they are having a particular person in the first three, such a student, such a doctor, is most likely going to be part of those who will be considered first for the scholarship. So do not be casual, do not be nonchalant about the application process. The preparation strategy, from where you are now as a student, you have a responsibility to be excellent. It is better you are in a position where it's not just because um, Maybe a few will require first class. If you're not going for the Ivy League schools, quote unquote, John Hopkins, Harvard University, you just want to go to schools in maybe the first 10. The Ivy League schools, typically, they are like the first five within those countries most times, or maybe the first 20. If you are excellent academically and you have proofs, distinctions, you are best in these courses, you came out of our all best graduating students, you already put yourself on a pedestal that sets you apart. And excellence, as we know, it is not just doing well once. It's a commitment to consistently do well all through your medical school. It's important. You should have done the regular, the relevant coursework, rather. Now, for some of you that will be going maybe for a master's in public health, sometimes they would ask for maybe a course or something you've done pertaining to statistics. Sometimes it will be, you can, you know, put, pitch that you did in your final year or maybe year four community medicine posting. Some may require something beyond that. So this is the place of awareness. Anytime you are looking at a scholarship for the particular course that you are going for, watch out for what the university is after, the admission body, what they are looking out for so that Beyond what you've gained in medical school, you can register for some courses. There are some courses that are hosted, you know, I've done some virtually, you know, from schools in the in Canada, in the U.S., as the case may be. And you can get them at really affordable rates because you can host them or participate in it as a group. Extracurricular activities, gone are the days where nobody is going to come and give you money and say, you know, go to school just because... Of per- for personal aggrandizement, you know, you want to associate with yourself that you've won the scholarship. There's no track record of impact. There's no track record of service. They are not after net, so to say. Uh-huh. You need to have been seen doing something contributing to society. For 95% of the scholarships, this is something that they are after. A goal-driven individual, you're excellent academically, but you're also concerned about things happen in the world. And one good thing for medical students is every nation in the world, they are considered, they are concerned about health, healthcare. There's hardly any scholarship that doesn't put, you know, medical professionals as part of those who they award. That's just a simple truth. So participate in leadership roles within CMDA as God helps you and gives you the opportunity. Outside CMDA, you have medical student associations, participate, engage, Be wise. All of those things will contribute towards your chances of, and, you know, don't give yourself this excuse. I interact with students again sometimes, and when we're talking, it's like, oh, I don't have passion for this. I don't have passion for leadership. You may really not know what you like until you try it. Leadership is an experience. It is stressful, I would say. It's burdensome, but it's a making process for you. It does something to you that these organizations are looking out for. It invites discipline, responsibility, a higher sense of responsibility than just the average student. So it's not about, I don't have passion for this. Just be a part of it. Contribute. It's not only the things you are passionate about. Maybe you are a musician. That's all you say you have passion for. Life is not just about your passions, you know. So find a way to contribute to your campus. Find a way to contribute to the community that you're currently in. 
personal development engage in internships if you have breaks you can join internships with some um, public health non-governmental organizations essentially maybe in project management in health different you know shapes and form that they might come in participate in workshops conferences these conferences that you see that we're doing you know cmda all of these things they come into play by the time you're saying you attended conferences up to six times maybe in six years and all and you put everything there you put the fact that you learned compassion in healthcare you learned competence again this house is a beautiful place to thrive a very beautiful place to thrive unintentionally you, you may not know but the house already gives you an added advantage against the average student who is just maybe so immersed into a book book and not concerned about personal development. This thing we are doing now is like a workshop, you know, so something like this can also count. As another thing, you have to be collecting your experiences and everything you're engaging in as you journey through medical school. It's very important. So we talked about discovery, preparation, and then the pace of taking action. And action includes positioning. You have to position yourself for success. Craft a compelling personal statement. I have read some personal statements online and it just blows my mind. You know, people can tell stories that the committee reading it would resonate with. A personal statement is different from your curriculum vita. Your CV would show your academic achievements and all. The personal statement needs to be tailored towards the qualities the scholarship body they are after. So if they are looking for things like leadership, you communicate in more detail the leadership roles you've occupied, the impacts you're able to achieve. If they are looking for values like maybe integrity or moral force of character, you will give real life encounters during your period of service or during the period of community involvement where you had situations that necessitated you utilizing those personal values that you have. So it's not just to write, it's not about your achievements, so to say. It's not to write, I was this, I was that, I know. They want a real story that they can see and know that you have lived a certain life so far. It's not just the fact that maybe in the last one year or two years, because you know you are going to apply for this scholarship, you start doing one course here, doing this year, attaching in. No, they would want real life experiences beyond you know the formal settings of learning all of those will count but a real life experience is very important i can't go into the details of like how to craft a personal statement in full but you can do yourself the good to watch videos online of successful candidates who have written personal statements it will do you um, a whole lot of good letters of recommendation now this is for those of us that like to say um you know Ah, I don't like to be known by a lecturer. I'm just on my own. So you are going to medical school now. Lecturers don't know your face. You stand at the back in ward rounds. They don't even know your results. Uh -huh. Like some students may not be known facially, but from performance, ah, this student is always getting high. They will know math numbers, no results, start asking. Nobody knows you. If you are going to apply for a scholarship, it might be difficult getting across to lecturers. And you know, a Scholarship letter of recommendation is meant to be detailed. There are some le lecturers that you will ask to write a letter of recommendation for you. They will just write to whom it may concern. I tutored this student during his uh, 400 level student. He was a hardworking student. He was this five lines. Meanwhile, a lecturer who knows you, whom you've established a good relationship with in terms of honor, in terms of your service. There are sometimes randomly I send my mentors who are lecturers I'll just tell them, ah, ma, if you have anything to do, I'm free this period. They might send, maybe help me prepare a slide, help me do this, and I'll gladly do it. Those are emotional investments that I'm making so that when I have to reach out to them, most times they are the ones rushing. Ah, any scholarship, anything you want me to write, please let me know. And I don't have to stress. So you can have maybe five or six persons who you are close to. You're not doing it to be a parasitic mentee or a parasitic student 
look out for avenues that you can also help your lecturers it is key so you have to secure very some when some lecturers write letter of recommendation for you they will write as much as two pages these persons they are on admission panels they know what they are looking for you know even those persons outside they are aware of the kind of things that they are looking for so establish good relationship with your lecturers create your portfolio of achievements as you're going through your medical training from year one year two year three year four start writing all your achievements because you may forget some of them at a later time and then of course demonstrate clearly your leadership and your community engagement when is the right time to apply it's not a one size fits all answer it depends on the level you're in preclinicals clinicals for some of you it's a few years time maybe in your final year we've had students across the country who from final year they already admitted into phd programs even without masters those who want to skip masters meaning maybe they don't want to do the youth service within our country whatever it is you've prayerfully taken a decision you can apply for some during your internship you can apply for some during the national youth service program you can apply for some during your final year this is for postgraduate for undergraduates within your year one and year three you should be looking out to apply for these scholarships consider your age the profile you've built and the leading of the holy spirit sometimes you may not think that you've meet the criteria but you've made efforts you've come close and you know the holy spirit tells you go ahead and apply you'll find favor you should also keep your you know heart open for that it's very important so you have the responsibility to research we're summarizing now we're coming to and you, you have the responsibility to research for scholarships there are online databases and resources i've put some links up in this slide opportunities for youth opportunitydesk.com fast web university financial aid offices for for some they are hidden, if I put it that way, is when you are applying to the university, you will now look at a section where they call funding. You will see a list of a lot of scholarships that are available. And for those of you who are interested in going abroad, when you're applying, there are college specific scholarships. So there are some colleges that have a lot of scholarships attached to them. It's not like in Nigeria where a university is a university, uh -huh, like it's just one. in schools abroad they will have a university and they might have up to 120 colleges this college is not necessarily where your department is located quote unquote but it's the body that identifies with you during your stay in university that this student is part of our college so their recreational activities their leadership programs and all you'll be a part of it now some colleges have more funding than others so you have to keep that in mind when you're applying, for those of you that will be applying for postgraduate training. Networking and mentorship is also a platform where you might get information. There are some scholarships that, you know, friends who are abroad now will just send, check out this, check out this, I think you'll be eligible. Check out this, I think you will be eligible. So you should have friends like that, you know, who you would also send opportunities to and would also send you opportunities. Social media, LinkedIn is a very good place for you to, um, you know, get emails from time to time when opportunities present themselves and be a part of other scholarship groups as well. Application process, please and please, I want to make an appeal. Your transcripts. After every, well, I say every level. Now, once your results are available, for those of you in preclinicals, try and do what is within your power to get your transcripts ready it's very sad when students miss out on opportunities because transcripts are not handy and you know if you're trying to get your transcripts in a university within our country most times it's challenging because of all the bureaucracies involved more so when you finish medical school don't say and is after wait is after house job i got my transcripts some months beef up some months after graduation because i applied for it before I left school and then someone picked it up from me and it was sent down to where I was because I needed to have it and I wasn't going to be taking, you know, that chance. So apply for your transcripts, your certificates. Once they are ready, please get them. Again, your personal statement is important. Select the right referees. Referees do not have to be vice chancellor or um, chancellor, deputy vice chancellor. The most important thing is that this person knows you and can attest to your character, your academic prowess. 
they will be willing to write something in detail about yourself it's not necessarily about the name or the office attached to it and also the if you're going for let's say a master's in sexual and reproductive health you'll most likely be looking for a lecturer in the department of obstetrics and gynecology if you're going for a master's in public health you'll most likely be looking out for a lecturer in community medicine or public health as it's called in some schools and then finally prepare for your interviews the interview is usually the final process first in some cases they will just do the interview to see your face ask you some questions it's like going for viva basically you may not really predict how it will go it's like oh it might just be congratulations you know we've seen this and they will ask you what are your plans post study and all that you can come in diverse forms but do your research get gather the common questions and if you have friends they can just help you like do mock interviews so you feel prepared manage your time very well create a timeline it is sad when a deadline catches up with you because you're very busy create a timeline for applications i was you know reminding a student who happens to be my mentee recently about scholarships that had sent links for apply for this apply for this and one of them sadly the deadline had passed and i was a bit offended but um, please set reminders create a timeline by in two weeks time i would have submitted this in three weeks time i would have contacted you know the lecturers most times the lecturers will need like two months or a month to you know prepare what you're, you're asking for because they are very busy and it's it's not that it's one week to the deadline you start saying you need a reference letter it doesn't work that way put them in a position where when the deadline is coming they will know that you gave due diligence to ensure they were informed early by the time you are texting them you know i'm like ama I sent you something two months ago. I sent a reminder last month. The deadline is in two weeks' time. They will definitely do what needs to be done at that point in time. Prioritize what is important. From the onset, start writing your personal statement. Don't be in a hurry to submit. Review it over and over and over again. When it's perfected, you can go ahead and submit. A personal statement, academic statement, some of these things have you know, slight differences, but I think we can leave it at that for now. Common mistakes that students will make sometimes. Students miss deadlines. Sometimes we make generic applications. Again, it's not a case of one size fits all. Yes, you're applying for a master's in public health for those going for pub, you know, public health postgraduates. It does, it's not one personal statement or one academic statement that you throw to 50 schools. If you read the admission requirements for those departments, you will notice that there are minute differences. And whatever it is that you are writing has to be tailored towards that. It might be the same public health, but some may have a master's in administration attached to it. Some might have an, um, a master's in business administration attached to it. Some might have an MD degree attached to it. So it can come in different forms. You want to make sure that your what you've written is tailored towards that specific one that you're applying for. Another mistake sometimes is incomplete submission. No matter what you've put forward, if your application is incomplete, it will not even be considered in most instances, particularly for committees that review this, you know, from abroad. So let's keep that in mind. And proofreading. Don't just write and submit. Don't just write and submit. Read over and over again. Correct the grammar. Correct what needs to be. That reminds me, some of these scholarships, some of these schools will require you to have an English language assessment, IELTS, um, 12, or the OET exams, whichever one that they are requesting for. The local scholarships, of course, nobody um, requests that, but if you're going international, most times it's necessary. Um, I've shared the example of Dr. Tolu as well. Um, there are a few persons, some, you know, who were CMD students while they were in school, but they are scattered all over the country. Our very own father in, you know, CMD, Professor Chima Onoka, he was a beneficiary of a scholarship, I think, in public health, and that took him to the UK after his internship or so. And some of our leaders, some of them are on, you know, PhD scholarships. And also, um, this can tell us that it's not out of our reach you know it is within reach it is at hand you need to prepare you need to position yourself and you need to take action 
I've shared largely the strategies that you need to employ during your application process. It's key. And know that nothing is impossible to him that believes. So sometimes you'll be very convinced that you are fit for this scholarship and you apply. Perhaps you may not get it. Other times, it's something that you do not even believe. You just like maybe took the leap of faith. Like, okay, well, you know, God, I believe will help my unbelief situation. And then it just comes, the letter of acceptance or the congratulatory email that you've been awarded. Is. So you have to try. Don't be scared of rejection. It can be painful when a rejection email comes. Or sometimes you see these stories of people online They've gotten scholarships to maybe 50 schools, admission in 40 schools. Some people are very determined. They will literally cast the bread on waters, many waters, and, you know, they will see the dividends and reap the rewards. So let's keep that in mind. Nothing is impossible. Start early. Stay persistent. The fact that you got a no once doesn't mean you should be discouraged. What another school is rejecting, another school may be looking for you and they'll be very glad to have you. Or another scholarship organization will be very glad to have you. They will be delighted to read your personal statement and welcome you into the organization. So start early, be persistent, be excellent in every phase of your application and take action. Don't be casual, like I said, you know, earlier. Every part of the application process is key, it's important and it's necessary okay i think at this point i will take questions and answers okay thank you very much sir for that session it has been very enlightening and i've learned quite a lot i feel like going to apply for scholarships like now 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 save Thank you very, very much, sir. Please, let's thank our speaker in the chat section. If you have been impacted in even half of the way that I have, you wouldn't be scared to say thank you in the comments section. Please, let's keep it going. And very quickly, we'll be taking questions. So if you have a question, please just indicate by raising your hand. And if for any reason you cannot speak, you can use the chat section to ask your questions. So please, we'll take questions. Okay. Seen about two hands. So I think we'll start. Um, Sini Felix, please, you can ask your question. Okay. Um it seems like yes, because I'm down. Um only to your colleague, please you can ask your question. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Am I being heard please? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this question. It was very, very educational. Okay, mine is more of a concern. Um, let's say, let's say, um, you finish school and you start applying because you don't know when you're going to be taking and you get some 
be a client so that you'll be practicing and then you get a scholarship before your NYC. I don't know, if you leave NYC and go and do your scholarship, so how is it going to help you? How will you be persistent if you get such an opportunity and you explain your NYC and go for it? It will cost you a lot whenever you want to come back to Nigeria. I don't understand the relevance of that. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, Oluchi, I think you have to take the question again because the sound was a bit muffled. I don't know if you're using like earphones or something. Let me, I, I think I was able to make out what she said. Okay. So okay. essentially, Oluchi, you're asking that if you get a scholarship and let's say you've not started NYC or it's during NYC, if you leave it, what would the consequences be? Are the consequences grave? That's what you're asking, right, Oluchi? I hope she can hear me. Okay. So I will just, you know, now, um, like we've said before, timing is important. So, and then your NYC is very important. That's the, that's the truth. As much as, you know, it may not be what people want to hear now because most persons are, you know, in a rush to leave the country, as the case may be. NYC is very important. If you're applying for jobs, NGO jobs, federal government jobs, one of the requirements you'll see there is either NYC discharge certificate or NYC exemption certificate. So by virtue of not doing the National Youth Service Program, if you peradventure come back to Nigeria for anything, you are already excluded from 90% of the opportunities that will be available if you are interested in working with the government. Now, it may not be that you're interested now. In future, you may get an appointment. Come and be Minister of Health. Come and be Commissioner for Health. And you didn't do NYC. Automatically, such person will be disqualified. You know, we've seen it play out in the Nigerian setting where ministers get appointment, they will trace back to 20 years ago and they will say this person did not do NYC. So you don't want to be in that kind of position. But if you're sure you have no ties with Nigeria, there are a few persons, you know, who I know that have taken that leap and they like, you know, it's bye-bye and they don't want to quote unquote waste that one year. Also, you can go for the master's program if it's master's and maybe it's not residency and come back and do the NYC. Because let's say you get a scholarship that is age sensitive, meaning once you are more than, let's say, 25 or 23, you will lose the scholarship. You can't defer it. And NYC is open till the age of 30. So if it's a case like that, you go for the scholarship, you come back, you know, to the country, do your NYC, maybe write your exams, primaries, or if you're trying to go outside, whichever exams you need to write, you write and you move on from there. So. You just need to weigh what's important, what is important, what you consider important to you, and be led by the Spirit of God as well to take the best decision. All right. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I Okay, so um Enel Bong Udo, please, you can ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the session. Okay, my question is to the personal statement. Please, can you explain again how we are supposed to write the personal statement? Because I don't really get it due to network connection. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so a personal statement is like a, a full assignment. Uh -huh. The summary of it is the fact that you have to look at the criteria the scholarship has put out there. And you have to give a narration of how your life's done so far mirrors that. In most instances, that's you know what is needed. They'll tell you, tell us your story, yourself. Um, and I like to put it this way to make it clearer. So it's about your past, your present, and your future. So you're saying you want to do this master's program. You're saying you need this scholarship. Why should we give it to you? How have you lived your life so far? How does your past connect to your present? You know, and where are you going? You know, if let's say, let's take public health, for instance. 
for most persons, they will, you know, write that, you know, it started when they were young, a passion to help people, a passion to save lives, and this led them to come to medical school to study, and they've been engaging in volunteering activities, they've been in medical outreaches between year two and final year, and directly or indirectly, they've attended to more than 4,000 or 5,000 residents within a particular state, and they want to take the passion forward because they're interested in leadership, whether in an NGO or whatever setting or at the intersection of academia and clinical medicine, you know, so this just ties the person's past to the person's present and links it up with the future where the person is going. So that pretty much gives a narrative of, you know, how it's meant to go. But when you look at the criteria that has been set out, that would determine largely what you should put down and how you should go about a personal statement. I hope that summarizes you know well for you to just have it in mind you know about yes sir thank you very much sir thank you all right okay chinaza chuku karen you have the floor please okay good evening sir good evening. thank you so much for this section good evening everyone okay i wanted to ask um the last time i asked this question but the person was not able to answer me about house job they said after induction we know that you are given a certificate but is a provisional license yeah. for your house job so i want to know is there any what's the duration of the license i heard someone saying you have to do your house job within that year that you graduate that, that's after you graduate you must do your house job within the next one year to avoid the license expiring so i don't know if you are aware of how long your provisional license can stay after graduation that's fine so um provisional license lasts for two years it's not one year it's 24 months and this is so because in the past people don't usually get house job immediately like now we get it through the portal and all that or in the past people will be traveling from state to state it's one year they've not gotten six months they've not gotten you know a house job space you can't tell that person who's um, it's not a fault of his to come and reapply for a license so the li provisional license actually spans a period of 24 months if within that 24 months a graduate a doctor has not gotten a space for internship whether of his own fault or by virtue of a conscious decision that person would have to reapply for a provisional license but there will be a penalty yes there will be a penalty the penalty can vary it can come as a fee it can come as a withdrawal of the license for maybe six months depending on what the arbitration courts at the medical and dental council decides but that's what you should be aware of the license lasts for 24 months within that period you're meant to do your internship Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Vanessa Miri Omomia. You can go ahead, please. Okay. Okay, good evening, sir. Miss, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. Oh, okay, good evening, sir. Good evening, everybody. And my question just spans around what you said concerning volunteering that um, extracurricular activities and you know passion you said um we shouldn't really say oh i don't have passion for this i don't have passion for that so i just needed a bit of um clarifications um are you saying because they used to tell us that you know volunteer whatever you have passion for you can you know put your hands in into it what you maybe you have passion for let's say girl child for instance so join any girl child group you know you have yeah. passion for vulnerable people or so you just joined maybe a sickle cell group and all these are just based on passions but you mentioned oh you um you don't have to have passion for something to volunteer so i i kind of like oh i'm actually confused so i want to really ask if you could just really clarify what you said about volunteering and, and passion thank you sir so 
do what you are passionate about. Go ahead and do what you're passionate about. But now, let's say, you know in future you want to go into reproductive medicine or you want to go into artificial intelligence in medicine and you are in year three. Your heart now is burning for the elderly or burning for maternal mortality and you are doing things in that light. Let's focus on, let's say, artificial intelligence. Now, all of these things, they are community work but none is essentially tailored towards artificial intelligence in health, which is where you are going. So at that point, your drive may not necessarily be AI. You might be thinking, okay, well, maybe when I finish medical school or something, but if you know where you are going to, and you know that the scholarship has a criteria, internship or volunteering with like maybe a software company, a tech company or whatever. So what I'm saying essentially is, your heart may not necessarily be, you know, brimming with passion for that stuff where you are, but you should, any opportunity you have, it might be one month internship, maybe during a break, just find, you know, an organization that fits into that picture and tag along. It's again like building a house. You may not be in the presence of building something. Sometimes it's the people that are working for you that will be telling you oh madam oh god this thing is important so if you don't do this the house may stand a chance of collapsing or maybe there's a risk of fire outbreak you are not doing it necessarily because you like it but it's because it is necessary so you cannot live only based on what you like do what you like quite all right please that gives you a sense of fulfillment but when you look at where you are going to there's, there's some, let me be practical. So MasterCard scholarship, for instance, one of the things that they are concerned about is climate change. Everybody that gets a master's scholarship finds somehow to link their passion with climate change. So if you are a healthcare practitioner, for instance, and you're into maternal mortality and all that, you there's a way to link healthcare to climate change. And this will be from the angle that, you know, climate change has adverse effects on health. If you have done comment or public health posting, they would have taught you some of these things, respiratory diseases, COPD, you know, chronic bronchitis and all that. And you might now start saying that your passion is from the place of understanding that, you know, this thing has adverse, adverse effect on health. As a doctor, you will, you are doing things in that light. Maybe you've joined a planting trees um, program or you volunteered with an organization interested in climate change. It can come in diverse forms. But eventually your goal is public health so it's it's been wise and uh -huh. you have the knowledge of what this organization what they need and then you apply it in that light but please do what you're passionate about or just go the extra mile to add these other things i hope that answers your question um yes it actually did um just to kind of like summarize so you're saying that um also for people because i think there will be people like that people that may not really have a vivid picture of that exact thing you know it's not really clear maybe they're just even in their 200 level or even in just yeah. 100 level you know and they have passion for volunteering you're saying that any opportunity that comes they can actually just take it probably just for the experience and all sure. and whenever their passion comes they can just pick up from there so in other words, you may not really have passion for something, but just don't use that as an excuse. An excuse start from somewhere. Yeah, start yeah, from somewhere. Yeah, just start somewhere. from just start volunteering from anywhere. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, okay. I think I, I understand you very well. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. We also received some messages in the chat box. So I'll just be reading them out so that you could answer. So the first one is from Anyadundo Israel. And he says, thank you very much, sir, for this impactful session. Please, my question is about the personal statements and academic statements. What is the average length and what are the key points to consider and pitfalls to avoid in writing a compelling statement? So... Thank you, Israel, for your question. The average length of an academic, an academic statement is specific for the program you're going for. 
So a personal statement is like your life story summarized. So a personal statement is usually longer than an academic statement. And most organizations would ask for between 750 to 1,000 words. Some will put the limit at 500, but most times it's within 750 to 1,000. The academic statement, on the other hand, ranges between 250 to 500 words. Some would put 350, but it's usually shorter than a personal statement. So that answers the question um, of the average length. The key points to consider and pitfalls to avoid. So the key point to consider is make sure that the story you're writing fits the candidate they are looking for. Every program, they have a prototype candidate. So you have to sell yourself to fit that picture. So you look at your story, what part of my journey aligns with this and you bring you do so with evidence. You give practical examples, you know, and then don't be generic, like I said initially. So when you're writing sometimes, so if you see students that have written personal statements, some will go the extent of giving facts, like, you know, over 4.5 billion people in the world currently, according to WHO, lack access to essential health services, and over 50% of these persons are residing in Africa, over 10% are residing in Sub-Saharan Africa, when the committee, they are reading that kind of academic statement or personal statement, I'm sure they will be nodding. And another person just writes, my passion is to save lives. So I went to medical school and I want to work in an NGO in future. These, these two personal statements are already seemingly different. So don't be so generic. Go for extra details that really communicate the burning desire, you know, in your heart. And also, um, don't yes you know fine people can aid you sometimes in writing your personal statement but at the end of the day you know your story very well you know what you are passionate about so don't fall for the trap of just giving your personal statement or academic statement to somebody who is a professional in that light and just say write for me and you go and submit without reviewing it or without telling the person that okay this is the program i'm applying for in this school this is a link to the uh, admission requirement look through it i'm going to send you bits and parts of my own story summarized while the person you know develops it for you so that's one pitfall that you should avoid don't be too generic be very specific align your um past story your present and your future your goals with what the committee or the admission body they require okay thank you sir um, the next question is from Comfort Amos, and they said, God bless you for this session, sir. My question is about financial statements. In what format should it be? Is it to be written as a letter? Also, is it the applicant that is responsible for presenting a financial statement or another person, say, for example, a lecturer or head of department? Thank you, sir. Okay, so financial statement in this sense, the person is, you know, you mean maybe like a statement of account for those who's applying for a scholarship that is need based. So it will be the case that it's either of two things either the scholarship body will tell you to insert the email of your guidance or your parent in this instant, and the person would upload the statement of account over a particular period of time, maybe the last five years, so that they can review what is their official salary account or like their current account and see what's coming in and really see that, okay, this person doesn't have, you know, the required resources to fund your training. So it, it cannot just be any random person. It has to be the person who is officially standing as a guardian. If there are extenuating circumstances, like maybe such a student is an orphan, you can clearly state it and that will be very obvious that you don't have a sponsor and that kind of student of course will qualify for that scholarship on that basis so but other times you might leave it to you to retrieve the statement of account from the person and then you upload it they go extra miles to confirm you know these things they can contact the bank they can contact you know maybe central bank whatever the case is but they have systems already established in place to confirm some of these things. So, of course, there should be no room for anything like, you know, untoward or fraudulent. I hope that answers your question, Comfort.
Thank you once again, sir. Um, our next question is from Emma or Emma, not sure. Uh, it says, how can one get into volunteering opportunities with NGOs? Okay. So they are looking for you. Of course, you know they may not pay. Uh -huh. They need your skill as a medical student, as a doctor, the, what you can offer. It's called volunteering. So of their own volition, they might give you, you know, stipends or something, transportation and all that, but they will be very glad to welcome you. So you do your homework, which NGOs are within your um, physical space, the state, the school where you're having your training, or if it's something you want to do online, an opportunity online, you research and apply. United Nations, WHO, United States Agency for International Development. These are some NGOs, international NGOs that have branches worldwide and people get internship or volunteering opportunities with them. But you have to put forward the application. You have to search. Sometimes you can physically show up at their office and introduce yourself, carry your CV handy, you know, and say, oh, if there's an opening for this, this is your CV, they can contact you. There are diverse ways. People are very eager, actually, to have volunteers in most instances, so that should not be an issue at all. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, Samuel Edo asked about the transcripts that you mentioned if they are to apply for them after each part or after preclinicals in total okay so it's depending on your school some schools are very liberal with giving transcripts some of the non-academic staff in the office will send you back and tell you there's no need for it when there's a scholarship you know come and get it but if you establish good relationship with them or um, you have a provost that is very forward when it comes to opportunities for students there can be an instruction on ground any student that needs a transcript give the student because you might find a dead a scholarship and the deadline is in a week time that's not when they want to do their two or three weeks running around to give you your transcript so after each level apply for your transcript as far as results have been released apply for your transcript have it handy submit the letter of application if you have to reach out to your dean or whoever to talk with the person in those offices to give you say you're already planning to apply for a scholarship submit the names of the scholarships five six of them they would grant it or give it to you you know so just escalate to the next level of higher authority available that should help you sort out you don't have to wait till after preparing house to get your transcript Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Genetrical David Oli is asking if you could be a friend that will send scholarship opportunities to us. I don't know how many persons are in this meeting now. I, I can't, I can't make that kind of commitment here. Uh, but I think maybe the National Academic Department can come up with a platform or something that periodically they might just release okay locally these are scholarship opportunities available for students within nigeria to apply cmd nigerian students you are encouraged to apply internationally these are we can even make a list of these things now there's one school that does this very well in nigeria and that is university college pardon there is no school that they get as much scholarships grants and sponsorship it's because they are lecturers and the student bodies, they are very intentional about these opportunities. So we can take a leap from them and status quo. Every year, these scholarships are available. Students, doctors, please, you know, do your research. Anyone you are available, um, anyone you meet the criteria for, please apply. And if we have any resources to support them, counseling, and even maybe referees, you know, some doctors can stand as referees for students in their chapters. So there are ways that our local chapters and at the national level, we can help um, solve that. Thank you, sir. Um, again, we have a question that asks, do we need to write to professors in international universities in areas we are interested in? 
Okay. For PhD programs, yes, but not for master's programs. If you're applying for a PhD program, you're interested in core research. You're going to be doing research for like three to four years. And not every program accepts arbitrary research topics, meaning you cannot just wake up and they have a focus for the next 10 years and they have like 20 topics tailored towards you know that focus you can't come and just bring a new topic that you are giving your supervisor your potential supervisor additional work so you're going to research on the topics they are the themes that they are researching on at the moment look for the supervisors or the heads of those programs and then you message the person introduce yourself either via email or via you know maybe linkedin platform or any of the social media platforms you're a student in social country this is your passion maybe you've done a master's program you already have a research publication relating to that and you are willing to support their own research because that person is the head of the research team for that topic and so you're coming to say like oh sir i'm eager to support to be an additional hand an additional staff no and of course phd programs most of them are like assistantships so while you're doing it you're being paid you're actually teaching these professors are very busy and they would not mind you taking classes for them so of course they know that's how phd programs work they'll be looking out for students year in year out so you have to write emails or send requests via social media sometimes you can even establish relationship with them from now if you're in preclinical start liking their posts on linkedin on facebook you know be commenting they'll be seeing your name from time to time once in a while pop into their dm say what you have to say and um, you can move from there Thank you so much, sir. We have a question from Lau, and they said, Thank you so much, sir. Please, sir, would you advise us to print out all our certifications and have them in hard copy format? And I'm also wondering if these schools ask for proof of all the leadership positions you have held or participation in any other thing you have engaged in. Okay. Okay. So, you don't necessarily have to print out the certifications. The most important thing is that you have them. So have them either as hard copy or soft copy. If they ask for it, just upload it. But they would always put something, you know, that you agreed to be sincere and all of that in your application. You're not going to say what you did not achieve. You're not going to say what you did not do and they are taking you for your words if at any point during the application process they ask for something and within a stipulated time you cannot pro provide it you stand a chance of rescinding and lose rescinding and losing the scholarship totally even though you even maybe commenced your program so whatever it is that you're saying you have done it's good that you have evidence most of them will ask for your social media handles they will go there they will go and visit your linkedin page your instagram page your Facebook page. So this also tells you that as you're going for outreaches and all, be putting your the pictures out there. You are checking blood pressure, whatever the case is, it's what's out there. So that when they go and check, it's not like you have an Instagram account, but it's only one post that is there. Your picture, maybe after an exam or something. No. Put some life you know to your page and make it interesting that will serve as evidence as well for the things you've done okay thank you sir So the next question is from Bello Ehoiza. And they said, sir, can you suggest a platform where one can learn how to write a personal statement? I think a few people have asked similar questions soon.
Can you hear me? Um, okay, yes, I can hear you now. Hello? Can I be heard? Okay. Well, YouTube. YouTube is a very good place. Yes. Yeah. I can be heard. Can hear you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can hear you, sir. We can hear you. Okay, yeah. YouTube is a, is a very good platform to, to learn how to write a personal statement. There are many accounts. Students who have gotten scholarships, sometimes they would upload even like a picture of the, the personal statement they wrote, the mistakes that they made initially. So you can just put a compilation of all these videos together, save them. On you save the how does it to put it again? Watch later and have a playlist, personal statements, socks, test stories, mistakes. Just put everything together and have a note where you are making. There's a lady that you know applied for scholarships, she got rejected or everything in the first year. By the time she was applying the second year, she had done a lot of research, attended a paid seminar on personal statement writing. Every scholarship she had applied for every institution she got admitted she was the one turning down you know the ones she was not interested in. of course she has to settle for only one so there is that place of learning and you would have to do that research but youtube is a very great and very great platform to learn okay thank you very much sir for that answer mm -hmm. and um, okay, this is a very interesting question, and it's from Man of God, and he says, what is the fate of a 50-50% great student for scholarship? Yeah. So, there are some programs that that kind of student will not be able to get into. For instance, like Harvard, or John Hopkins, or University of Oxford. The chances are very slim, that's the fact because those schools are they will follow the track record of the student from high school from secondary school not because they are trying to be wicked because if you're coming into that kind of school they don't expect that you drop halfway or they would you know you just send the student off there has to be a track record of proving academic excellence at a higher level than normal however i had said in initially that the MBP is known to be a system that is not graded. So what they are looking out for most times for medical students is pass or fail. It is just these few Ivy League schools that still try to distinguish the grading of a medical student program. Some will tell you to ask your college to send your average score. You know, and speaking from experience now, your college will have to total all your scores just for them to have an idea, okay, where does this student then fall into but largely speaking it doesn't count yeah if you have been passing with 50 50 50 as far as you got this mbbs certificate pass is what they are interested you now have to demonstrate you know excellence in other areas like leadership you might have some leadership awards or the leadership experiences as the case may be or you volunteered and you are saying you've impacted over ten thousand people through your volunteering activities i mean that's excellent so the merit is not solely academic it can cross across other areas Okay, thank you very much, sir, for your answer. Unfortunately, I was locked out for a bit, so I think I've lost the messages in the chat box. However, okay. I, I saw can see it. Some. Okay, I okay. can see some. Yeah, so um, Ima asks the transcript we'll be using for the application. Is it a student copy? Yes, the one you would submit initially will be a student copy. Your school would have to send an official transcript directly via email carrier and um, the school you have applied to, they will get it and confirm that they've received it. So I hope that answers your question, Emma or Emma. Um, Michael Appan, can we only apply for transcripts when we are done with final year? You can apply for transcripts at any time. In your year two, you can apply for your year one transcripts or statement of results. That's what they like to call it sometimes. In year three, you can apply for year one, year two. After part one MB, you can apply for everything you've gotten up until that level. So it's not until you've graduated. Oh. The slides and recordings. 
if they'll be available. The National Academic Secretary will probably answer to that. Adeola, my question is for someone who is close to graduation and hasn't been involved in so much extracurricular activities because of academics. What can such person do? Start now. Now is the best time to start. Between now and when you finish NYC, you can have a lot of extracurricular activities under your belt. That's the truth. Partner with organizations, go for conferences, you know, volunteer. Do what you can do from where you are. During house job, opportunities to present themselves for medical outreaches, join and collate all those experiences. It's definitely never too late to start building. Can you show that page on links to check out scholarships? Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the slide will be available. So I will send it across to the National Academy Secretary. We'll probably post it on the page. If I can be mentor. I don't know if I am supposed to answer that question. Yeah, um, that, can, that, that person can reach out to the National Academy Secretary. He will get across to me. At what level of study is it appropriate to seek NGO volunteer work? I would say it's best after your pre clinic house. At least you can sell the fact that you have a good foundational knowledge of, you know, medicine. Maybe you know how to do basic stuff and whatever you're interested in. But having finished your pre clinic house, that should be something that counts. Another question on mentorship. You guys should reach out to the National Academy Secretary. I think that answers all the questions. Thank you very much for the um, opportunity. So, and thank you for your attention. God bless you all. Please put the things we discussed into practice. That's what will make me very happy and would have made this session fulfilling. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, sir.